Hey, what's up? On this episode of the Bullpen Podcast, listen to Sam Ball and I talk back and forth about crypto, how it affects traditional markets, talk about asset management systems like Coinbase, and then also listen to the crazy shit that takes place at the end that has me thinking maybe somebody else is listening. Oh, wait. One more thing before we get to the podcast. In this podcast, The Crypto Bunny, any co-host and his guests do not give financial or investment advice and encourage you to do your own research on all topics mentioned. Do not invest into this market what you can't afford to lose. I bet I know what you're thinking. Is this really Morgan Freeman? Well, unfortunately not. But Lyndon thought it would be a good idea to use such a soothing voice for the legal mumbo-jumbo to smooth things over. Now, let's do it. Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Play ball! for the bullpen podcast number nine the crypto bully wow (laughs) he makes it look so easy and that ball has left the stadium hey what's going on everybody i want to welcome everybody to the second official episode of the bullpen podcast i'm your host the crypto bully and pretty much here What we like to do is we like to get into the bullpen with some of the most influential and interesting individuals in blockchain and cryptocurrency. We like to pick their brains and get their opinions and see what they have going on in the crypto space. So today we have a really, really awesome guest today. So this guy is amazing. He's an investor. He's a well-known TED speaker and also a crypto enthusiast. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest for today. Sam Ball, how you doing today? Uh, very well. How are you? Uh, doing pretty good, man. I cannot complain. Um, I just want to say thank you for taking the time out of your busy day, man, to come through and uh, have a chat with me and, and kind of, you know, go back and forth about crypto. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Just for the people who may be unfamiliar with you, would you mind giving um, a little history about yourself? Tell us a little bit about how you became involved in blockchain and crypto, and uh, we can go from there. I first got into investing when I was at university, which is about, it was in my third year or so I got into investing and it was just stocks initially and it went very well. I made about 70% in my first year in the stock market. And then that led to me doing a TED talk. And before I did the TED talk, I tested it on my Toastmasters group. And at the end afterwards, one of the guys came up to me and he was like, oh, I didn't know you were interested in investing, me too. I was like, oh, cool. What kind of investing are you into? He's like, oh, crypto. And my initial reaction was like, you're not a real investor then, are you? Just throwing good money away. But he piqued my interest. And then um, I started following it a bit more. And uh, at the time, I think Bitcoin was at about $2,000 at that point. And I was, nice. um, I was looking at that and I was looking at the graph. I was like, it's a bubble. It's a bubble. It's going to go down. It's going to go. There's no way it'll stay at $2,000. <laughs> But I followed it, and then the more and more I got into it, the more I realized that it was here to stay, and I learned about all the other cryptocurrencies. Then I just I put some money in, which was obviously a good decision. <laughs> and I've got about 300,000 followers on Twitter, and I started doing more crypto tweets. And as a result of that, I was getting a lot of emails about it. And that led to um, an ICO approaching me to come on as an advisor which is the Nest platform, which I'm currently doing at the moment. That's probably a brief story. Nice. That's, that's pretty awesome, man. Just became aware of you not too long ago. Um, and I actually saw a bunch of people, they were stirring out the most recent TED Talk you did. And I was like, you know, let me let me check this out and see. And I was listening to it. I love that talk. I loved it for a lot of different reasons. But I feel like it was so simple to follow, whether you knew a lot and were very familiar with investing or you were new, I felt like anybody could have followed that. And that's what I loved about it most, because I feel like 
with what you were talking about, it really is transferable in all different types of investing, whether you're talking cryptocurrency, whether you're talking stocks and bonds. It's like the fundamental stuff that matters the most in those situations. And I feel like that talk really captured a lot of that. And I was just like, yeah, I, I got to talk to this guy. And like this guy, this guy is awesome. You can definitely tell he, he has knowledge. He knows his stuff from things you were referencing as far as books um, and things like that. I, it, it was awesome. It was intriguing to me. That's for sure. So, and then I know you were saying basically that you have the, the investment background and stuff like that. And, you know, that makes me want to ask you the, a big question that I see people going back and forth a lot. Cryptocurrency. Do you feel like this is, is an asset? Do you feel like it's a currency? Do you feel like it's both? It can be both? Like, how do you really feel about that, that classification? I think the issue, it's, you have to look on it, look at it on an individual basis. If you compare Bitcoin to something like, I mean, it's quite a good example is the one we're doing, which is um, the ICO I'm currently advising next. It's, right. They're completely different things because Bitcoin is there meant to be a currency. And Nest is just, it's not attempting to be a currency. And even yeah. if it was trying to, it doesn't tick that box. And I think it, it does require looking at it on a case-by-case -case basis. And I, I wouldn't want to be the guy who is put in charge of coming up with the rules for these things. No joke, right? Yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you 100%, man. Um, and that's what I think is kind of the beautiful thing about crypto. You don't have to be this or have to be that. It really is kind of an open playing field. So you have currencies, like you said, like Bitcoin that are literally, you know, going, they're, they're wanting to be a currency. But then you have other projects like Next and things like that that are really taking a different approach. And their their main goal is it to be a currency, you know, it may be to provide applications, things. There's a lot of different avenues you can come with. And I feel like those projects having the choice to do that and people having the choice to go, you know, back and forth between di different cri cryptocurrencies and see what they have to offer. I believe that brings a really nice element to the space that's really going to help down the line when people start to get more involved, hopefully. And, uh, you know, it becomes more of a mass phenomenon type of thing. So... I could definitely agree there. And I feel like there's so much transformation taking place in the space in general. You see like Coinbase are opening up the whole asset management piece and things like that. I find that so interesting. So interesting and seeing it transform to what it was years ago to now, you know, basically catering to a larger crowd. What do you feel about that? Things like that. As far as the asset management, you see how we have the CPOE futures. Do you feel like that's a good sign for crypto? I think it's a good sign because I, I think it validates it in a way. And also, I think with the Coinbase example you gave is quite interesting, just because they've been quite selective about what's going to go be in the fund. And I'd be interested to see if someone else comes along and says, we're going to do a top 20 crypto yeah. fund. How do they actually do that? Because when you've got, for example, Tron that had its massive run up earlier this year and last yeah. year, if that's very sort of briefly popping in and out, I'd be really interested to see how funds deal with that. And I think potentially just picking more stable ones for a fund is probably a better idea than saying that, because it's not like the stock market where you can just follow the S&P 500 and you can have an index fund. <laughs> it. it doesn't change that much on a day-to-day -day basis. So yeah. it's interesting. Definitely agree. But them being so selective of the coins that they, you know, bring into play and things like that, I think it will be interesting going forward. If we start having other exchanges or other entities in general that start to follow suit, it will become a lot interesting to see like, OK, what approach are you going to take to that? Like you said, is it going to be a top 20? Um, is it going to be a top 10, top five? But I can agree with you on a sense of it does make sense to have, you know, currencies, I guess, that are a little bit more stable. I can only imagine taking some of these altcoins that have market resets, <laughs> it seems like three or four times a year and, you know, throw those into asset management. It would be uh, interesting to say the least. So I can agree with you there. But when you're thinking about crypto already, right, and you're thinking about traditional investment vehicles, so we're talking stocks and bonds, real estate, commodities, how do you feel like crypto will start to affect those? Do you think it'll be a good thing, bad thing, indifferent? I think there'll be, first of all, I think there'll be a spillover there. Because okay. I think you will start, so for example, it's just a matter of time before a mining company goes public in a big way or something like that. Yeah. So you can invest in crypto through stocks and traditional methods. I think mm -hmm. that that is just a matter of time. And then I think it's also interesting, the point of view that the more it grows, at some point, money managers are going to have to sort of suggest to their clients that they put something in there just for the sake of diversification, if nothing else. Right. So at the minute, I think with a lot of, very, very, very wealthy people. It, it might still be a bit of a joke, but then when it's up there as an asset class and it's, and it's the market is, and this this is probably years off, but when the market is large enough, if you're a very, very wealthy person, you're invested in bonds, stocks, real estate, whatever else, 
it would just be stupid not to have something in crypto as well, just to have that diversification. And I think at that point, it, it's like a snowball, really. The more it gathers momentum, the bigger it's going to get. Without a doubt, without a doubt, I see that. And it's, it's funny that you say that because I get a lot of people, and generally, we start, I, think, I feel like a lot of the older individuals, older investors, you know, they, it's a lot of pushback. Uh, a lot of like, they're like, oh, what is, what is this crypto stuff? What do you what do you mean you're you know taking money that you made from real estate and putting it into this investment? Like it's not real. It's not real money. I was talking to a guy around. It was around Christmas, and this this guy is quite a wealthy guy. But I was trying to explain crypto to him why it was a good thing, and I was just focusing on Bitcoin because he was about I think he's about sixty. This guy, gotcha. and he, it's just it was just impossible because he, he doesn't even use online banking. He goes <laughs> oh, into banking. He wants to deal with the person, so I, I didn't really stand a chance. Yeah, interesting seeing people switch with their because he still knew what it was though he'd seen it on the news right yeah so it's like yeah you're starting to see it now uh, become a little bit more prevalent and throughout the media newspapers um, you know bigger bro- uh, networks are starting to pick it up and talk about it so I feel like when that switch really happens you really start to see it become a lot more valid as an investment vehicle it'll be interesting to see how those perspectives of those people change you know will they, will they keep you know pushing back against it or will it be more Will they be more inviteful to take it in and say, like, okay, maybe I really should take a look at this and see, you know, kind of what's going on. And you know what? That actually brings me to another good point, right? Because I feel like you have this group of investors, right? Whether you're talking about industry individuals, whether you're talking about venture capitalists, whether you're talking about the older individuals who are used to dealing with commodities, you know, real estate, more traditional ways of investing. When it comes to things like, for example, the SEC coming in and doing regulations and things like that. Do you think regulation is good for crypto because it kind of brings in that group? Or do you feel like it's more of a negative thing? Like, no, we should be pushing for no regulation at all and keep everything as decentralized as possible. I think no regulation is just, it's a nice idea, but it's based on the assumption that people act rationally and that people don't fall for scams and they don't chase easy money. And whilst you can take the view, well, they shouldn't do that. And yeah. if they're stupid enough to invest in BitConnect, then they'll get what they deserve. <laughs> they're trying to catch the bottom now and it's got like $720 of volume a day and it's still valued at $5 million. So if yeah. they think, oh, well, if I can get one fine. <laughs> you can argue if they do that, they get what they deserve. But I think there are, there's also the element that when I first got into crypto, I had no idea what I was doing. And when I first got onto Binance, I had a friend who was very knowledgeable at crypto and I was just buying things because he told me to buy them because yeah. it was just so complicated. I couldn't, I, even if I researched it, I didn't know what the hell it was going on. About. <laughs> I think people need some base level of protection and as well, it's not even just the base level of protection. I think there needs to be a level of accountability for the people that are trying to scam others and there needs to be some sort, because if it's unregulated, you can do what you like and if you get away with it, You've got away with it. So you, there's almost this incentive for bad behavior, really. But I think the approach that the SEC has taken so far, I'm just like to see how it develops. I think it is the right one. But I think certainly once we cross the trillion dollar market cap, I think at that point it is getting big enough where it does need some sort of regulation because that's when the public start are going to start coming in. And they do need that protection because otherwise it's just damaging in the long term because it will put people off if they get burned by it. I absolutely 100% agree. Like, I remember when I first got into it, and like you, I had a friend that had been in it, I think, for about uh, two and a half years. So they were more so familiar with it. Me, it was new to me. Now, I was familiar with technologies from just from my background and also with the stock market. So a lot of that knowledge was, you know, thankfully transferable. But as far as how cryptocurrency works just in general, I was completely lost. So I remember getting into it, and he showed me a lot. And then literally for about six months straight, I literally did almost nothing but white papers, learning fundamental analysis, learning how to evaluate coins, learning how, you know, exchanges work. Well, I mean, everything. And I did it literally almost day in and day out. And I can only imagine somebody that one doesn't have a, a financial or technology background and then not even having anybody to guide them in the space. That would be insane. That would be crazy. And it is, like you it's, said, it's really hard. I mean, for me, like to get my head around the concept of how Bitcoins were mined, yeah. I, I even like after a few months, I still didn't know. And eventually there was a book I read that broke it down. I was literally making notes on this book. Right. And some people, they, they don't do that. And it is it does take time, even if you know what you're doing and you're smart. I'd say it takes probably at least six months to get up to speed with it to a point where you can make good decisions. I absolutely agree. Yeah, definitely. That's why I always encourage people to, it's like a continuing education thing. You know, this is, this is one thing that pretty much just keeps going forward. It's not like, I mean, you, 
Literally, like I remember times to where I wouldn't, you know, be involved or read anything about crypto for like two or three days. And it was like, I just missed a whole year's worth of information and anything else. So it's, it's, it's pretty crazy, but I definitely agree with you there. And I feel like in time, things will get different. And I feel like hopefully people start taking a little bit more serious and they'll have a, a foundation to kind of learn with. And I feel like with regulation, it's it's one of those things that I feel like you're going to have, regu- you know, you're going to have exchanges and entities that do regulate and you're going to have ones that don't. So I don't think it's like, ah, oh, one one has to, it has to be one or the other. I feel like they'll be able to coexist. But majorly, I feel like it'll be helpful, especially for the mass of people, the public that comes in that doesn't have that knowledge in the background. You know, it kind of shields them a little bit. So there is some base level of self-governance is happening as well. I think if you look at sort of projects like Dash, for example, there is almost like a self-governance aspect. And even when you look at stuff like the Ethereum Foundation, there is a sense of trying to govern, even if it's not quite perfect. So I think the intention is there. Yeah, good intentions for sure. So yeah, I feel like that'll that'll be another aspect. So obviously self-regulation for sure, you know, that's good. You know, I feel like people... A lot of people, especially people who are more heavily in the crypto, they probably have somewhat of a preference to that. It's like, you know, why why get help from the government? Why not just self-regulate and hold people accountable? But at the end of the day, I feel like as long as something is put in place to make people accountable for what they're doing so that you don't have these Mount Goxes and BitConnects that are happening all the time, I feel like people f- will feel a lot more comfortable getting into it. It's like, okay, you think the mindset when you invest in anything, right? Only invest in what you can afford to lose. If you're looking at something like, more than likely I'm going to lose this. And it may not even be because I make a you know bad investment decision per se, just because it's the wild, wild west. It's like, all right, I don't, you know, how, how could people feel comfortable doing that? So, you know, I definitely mm-hmm. feel like it's good with that. But, and another thing, so with the way the, the space is set up now, right? It's like, you see a lot of, you know, ah, Bitcoin, no, Bitcoin cash, or, you know, this or that, and a lot of competition that, you know, who's going to be the top and things like that. Do you feel like that competition a good thing do you feel like there needs to be more kind of camaraderie in the space like there should be almost like a unison like everybody should be striving more so towards that same goal i don't know because i think everyone has different things that they actually want i mean even with bitcoin people have their own different views about what it should be the only thing i don't like about the bitcoin versus the bitcoin cash argument i actually as a coin i prefer bitcoin cash but lightning network it's gone a lot better than i expected and it does seem to be working so it's, it's sort of like there's arguments on both sides, but I think both sides are at fault because I think I like Bitcoin Cash as a concept. I think it's got a great team behind it. And I think really importantly, I think it's got a really great marketing team. Like it's got, yeah. it's got business people in it. It's got people who know how to get people using it. Right. And what I don't like about it is I don't like the argument that it's the original Bitcoin because it sticks to Satoshi's vision. The argument that it started in 2009 is just not, it's just not the case because otherwise, Litecoin's the original Bitcoin, Bitcoin right. Private's the original Bitcoin, Bitcoin Gold's the original Bitcoin, and it, it just goes on and on and on. Yeah. And it just really, I think the one that hasn't forked should be considered the original Bitcoin. But then equally on the other side, I, th- I think there is almost a smear campaign against Bitcoin Cash to the yeah. point where like, when it had first forked, and I, I didn't know that much about it, I was very, very much against it just because so many people that I followed were also against it. And it was quite a vicious set of attacks. Like, I remember when, I think it was Pirate Bay, you know, the torrent site Pirate Bay, they had a little thing at the bottom for donations. And they had a Bitcoin address, I think they had a Litecoin address and an Ethereum address. And then they had a little thing saying Bitcoin Cash LOL. And I was showing that to my friends. I was like, look, it's a load of, it's a yeah. load of rubbish. <laughs> I understood it more. I, I actually... Well, actually, it's a good coin and I like what they're doing. And I think increasing the block size is one way to solve the scaling problem. Lightning Network is another. I think it's it's just go more to what you want. I think if you are, you're more ideological in the sense that you do not like the idea of transactions being done off chain, go more towards Bitcoin Cash. Exactly. If you don't really mind that, use Bitcoin. I think, it's, I, I guess it would be nice if everyone just got along, but. Yeah, yeah, but you, you know how that goes. Cause that's what I was thinking, like, uh, <laughs> you know, taking that approach. I feel like, you know, it, it shouldn't be like, and I agree with you on the fact that Bitcoin Cash, you know, they're trying to say they're the original Bitcoin. I'm like, you really shouldn't even have to make that argument because I feel like they're both trying to do the same thing, but in different ways, which isn't a bad it, thing. Because it's not illogical that you think, oh, Bitcoin.com, at Bitcoin on Twitter, right? These are reliable <laughs> sources. Exactly. It just puts people off because I think if you're a new user and you want to buy Bitcoin, you can't even work out which one it is. Right. You're not going to go any further. 
I know, exactly. And that's all I was saying. And I, could you imagine, right? So, you know, recently IHOP did the whole name change and it went from IHOP to mm-hmm. IHOP. Could you imagine if you had a, a team of people that were like, no, 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 no. We don't like IHOP. IHOP, you know, we're going to stick with IHOP. And then you have two different versions and IHOP is like, oh, no, I'm we're the original IHOP. Like, wait, what? Like, how does, well, like, why half can't you? the rest with IHOP and half with IHOP. <laughs> exactly. Like, it would be crazy. So I feel like in time, it, it, it hopefully that, that'll play out differently and you won't have that. And that's what I love about projects like, for example, uh, the Declaration of Currency Independence and uh, what, should, you know, what would Satoshi say? Because I feel like they really help kind of bring back to everybody what crypto is really about, you know, more of the Satoshi vision, more of, you know, we should be worried about trying to advance all of this together rather than have too much competition to the point to where it almost starts to become unproductive. So it's like, you know, like you said, it's per coin. It could be per project. And, you know, projects vary a lot based on whether they just want to do, you know, be a cryptocurrency, be just a currency itself. You know, are they going to provide services? You know, are they going to provide dApps? You know, there's a lot of different avenues to go. So I feel like that'll be real interesting. Also, when I think about things like that, um, one thing that I think about a lot. So when you talk about projects, right, you have projects that, you know, do these large ICOs and they raise millions upon millions of dollars to be able to fund themselves, to be able to do different things and to have a lot of options. But then you also have, you know, these smaller projects that are more, you know, community based and things like that. ECC being one that I'm obviously familiar with being on, on the team. My question to you is that when it comes to those type of projects, the ICO projects versus the smaller community projects that don't have as much money or as you know as much funds available in order to push themselves, but are really solid projects. Do you feel like that they have as equal of a chance as the ICO projects to really make an impact on the crypto space? Firstly, a lot of these like smaller projects they're still raising millions of dollars, right? So how small are they really? And then secondly, the larger ones are, are raising obscene amounts of money, so maybe in their billions of dollars. I think if they're a load of crap, they're just a load of crap with more money. It's it's not going to change that. And I think it's I think if you look at EOS as an example, they've raised four billion dollars. Doesn't seem to work particularly well. And then you had the, the news the other day where like seven people or whatever it was have decided, or the, the however a select a very few number of people decided to freeze certain accounts and yep. wallets. And at that point, eventually the market will see that for what it is, and it's. It's very, very centralized. It's not, it's it's basically just $4 billion as it stands. It's not done anything. It's not built anything. There's a lot of people who are investing. And if you ask them why they've invested, it's, oh, well, they've got $4 billion. Like they'll be able to make it work with that much money. And it's like, the two don't necessarily correlate because like people like to say, Bitcoin never had an ICO and that's the biggest one. And it's not any different to traditional money either because if you look at silicon valley there are people who've just come out of college and they've got ideas and they're good ideas but they don't have anything to back it up and they're raising millions of dollars themselves yep. and i think it's it all it does is it, it mirrors the real world because that's just what the real world is like where yep. there's money to be made people will just invest in ideas and nothing else and i think as time goes on people will wise up to that a bit more and where projects have raised a lot of money if they don't deliver they will subsequently be revalued by the market, whether they like it or not. Yep. So I think it's a problem that takes care of itself, given enough time. And I agree. I agree a lot with that. And, you know, funny, something that I usually tell people when they ask me about doing fundamentals on a coin, especially the people that are unfamiliar, I'm like, you have a lot of solid projects out there, projects that have a lot of great things to offer. But a lot of them, at least at this point, are ideas. You know, very few projects actually delivered products, which doesn't make necessarily make them a bad thing. But again, you want to be careful of, uh, of things like that. Because when you have projects like Tron and like EOS, you know, they've raised a lot of money, a lot of money. And they have a lot of um, expectations to be met based off of the things that they've said that they want to do with that money and the things they want to create. And, you know, I tell people, you know, when it comes to stuff like that, like you said, it's almost like they have to deliver. Like, you're going to have to bring something to the table because if not you run the risk of the market basically correcting that valuation and saying like okay wait a minute you know you raise all this money you could you imagine raising four billion dollars it being like four years later and it's still like you know we're working on stuff main exactly, net, like in that scenario they're not still going to be in the top 10 on exactly the market. Exactly. There's no way that's going to be the case. Because people will value it downwards because people are just like, I'm not waiting around. I'm out. I'm selling this. If some other idiot wants to buy it off me, then I'm happy to take a loss. Exactly. And that's what I tell people. I was like, 
you know, people throw around the term shitcoin a lot. And I've seen people call, you know, horrible project shitcoins and great project shitcoins. So, you know, but it's funny. I was, I tell people, I was like, the projects you need to watch out for are the shitcoins that are wrapped in gold. <laughs> Cause those are the ones, like I have seen some projects that on the surface look amazing. I'm talking about website, everything presentable that a person is going to look at when they first go and do an evaluation on the coin. It looks great. But then you start digging deeper, you go deep into the community, you really, you know, you really look at the GitHub if they have one available and things like that. And you're just kind of like, uh, some, something's not right. Like I'm, I'm pretty positive two plus five doesn't equal 100. So I need to, uh, I need to step back and reevaluate re- what they put out here on the table. So, and I think that whole ICO thing and raising a bunch of money can sometimes clouds people's minds because I know I hear a lot of people say often, like, oh, if you have a project that raises a bunch of money with an ICO, then there's a really great chance that they'll succeed. And I'm just kind of like, uh, I don't know if there's really a correlation between that. Because just because you have a bunch of money doesn't mean that it's going to automatically mean you're going to be successful. You know, can you use that money as a great means, um, you know, to help propel you in the direction? Of course. But if there isn't any substance to what you're doing, then, then there's still eventually going to end up being a problem, uh, you know, going to end up being a problem. And like, especially this last year, right, there was like an ICO craze, like the amount of money that was being raised on these ICOs was ridiculous. Like, it was crazy. I was like, wow, like that's, you know, you, you're raising IPO type money and I'm, I'm you know, more than IPO type money. It, it's amazing. But do you think that there will be a curve against that? Do you think eventually that will slow down and it'll stop? You won't have these ICOs that are raising 20, 30, 40 million dollars? Or do you feel like that that will just completely continue to happen? I, I think it's a yes and no kind of thing. Because I think on the one hand, if you look at when crowdfunding just started like a few years ago and people first got on that, like some of the ideas that were being thrown around, they were great ideas, but they, they weren't scientifically possible. There was one that was um it was essentially like a little piece you put in your mouth. And you'd go underwater and it like it somehow turned the water into air and let you breathe. And it raised a lot of money. I don't know if it's where they took their their idea, but you've got them in Star Wars. And it's it's a great idea. There's no denying it's a great idea. If you could put a little thing in your mouth and go swimming for however long you like and not have to come up for breath, that, that would be great. I'd buy one of those. <laughs> right. But if we can't make them, it doesn't matter. I mean, if, if they went out and raised $4 billion and then they weren't able to create the thing, it, it just doesn't matter. It takes care of itself. So I think there will be a, a sort of a slowing down in that sense. And this is a new way to raise money. And people are naturally very excited about that. Right. And because of that, they just, they, at the minute, I think people, they just want a bit of everything. And if they see a good idea and they like the idea, sometimes they don't look beyond that and they, they will just invest in it. But I think as time goes on and people get more used to it, they, they will wisen up a bit. I think also it's 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 worth noting that like well like I said there are stupid ideas that raise a lot of money in the real world too but I, I think as time goes on there will be less of that but then the flip side of it is as time goes on as the market grows there's probably going to be even more money getting raised and all you can really do is hope that that money is being raised for good ideas but if me and you come up with a stupid idea if the market wises up it doesn't matter people won't invest in it yeah and I think. As time goes on, that will happen. I agree. Yeah, I think people will start to get smarter. Then you you have people that get tired of being scammed. You have the people that will get tired of seeing money raised, like a lot of money raised by certain projects, and then nothing really happening. Um, you I get, think a lot of them, they're, not, they're not even scams though. They're just they're just bad investments. And they, I agree. I think people people sometimes you do need to make one or two of them just before you start to know what to watch out for. Yeah, and I think too. I think a lot of people underestimate the difficulty of creating a blockchain project or a product. Because I know one thing, when I was talking to the lead dev, um, you know, when I first ever started talking to the lead dev at BCC, I'm not by trade a coder. You know, I'm generally, you know, I was a software QA tester. So I was the one that worked along with the developer that basically tested the code that he created. So up until before that point, I had never sat down and had a conversation with the developer in crypto and saw like, okay, what is this really about? Well, I sat down and I had a conversation with him one day for probably about an hour and a half, two hours. And I was just like, mind blown. You know, I was just like, oh my God, like this is, this is, this is different. This is not coding something else, you know, just a website or things like that. So I feel like when I got a grasp on that and I really realized what that was about, it really kind of put in perspective for me expectations going forward and what projects can or can't do or will or won't do. And, you know, when a, you know, when a project is, is, you know, saying, oh, we're going to do this, that, this and that and this and that, and, you know, trying to get a realistic time frame or idea in my mind, 
you know, thinking like, okay, how long would this really take? And then obviously that's very different based on each developer you're working with too. How much experience do they have coding? How much experience do they have within the crypto space? You know, have they worked under anybody else? You know, it's just like so many different avenues and so many different things to, to think about and observe that I really feel like that as hopefully as time goes forward, you will have people that create pretty much companies or courses or whatever that really more properly inform people on what to expect. Because I mean, you know, most people are, are subject to the whole instant gratification thing. People want to throw money in and then they want to see it come back tenfold the next day. I think you do have a lot of people as well. It's, um, I can't remember who it was, but it's more of a stock investing thing. It's a, I think Burton Malkiel, I think that's how you pronounce it, but he's he's written a book called A Random Walk Down Wall Street and it's a really good book. It's, it talks about stock investing and the different methods of doing it. It's a great book. One of the things he talks about is the castles in the air theory and what that is. That, that someone will paint this picture of this castle in the air and it's a really great thing and everyone gets really excited by it. And what happens is people stop looking at the fundamentals and what they do instead is they look at this and they'd be like, well, I don't really care about the fundamentals. I don't really care if it succeeds. But I think someone is going to be willing to buy this from me at a right. higher price in the future. And as long as that continues, it's a good investment. So there are people who've invested in really poor projects and it's been a good investment for them just because there has been some idiot like, yeah. that bought it at the higher price. Like there will have been people that bought BitConnect at the very top. But then at some point that eventually comes crashing down. And I, I think with, that's what's going on at the minute. I think there is a lot of, traders that are putting money into these ICOs just because they know they will be able to sell them to a bigger idiot later on down the line. <laughs> right. And if they can't do that, they're happy to take that loss just because they've got lots of other ICOs they're investing in. And they know that overall, they will make money on them. Yep. And I think as the market grows and matures and more money actually comes in, they'll be less able to do that because they won't. the markets won't move as quickly. Like in five or 10 years time, there aren't going to be I mean, they might still be around just because of the nature of ICOs and how much it's raised, but there's right. not going to be all these hundred baggers just walking around everywhere. There aren't going to yeah. be people that are just constantly selling something for 30 times their money there, 70 times <laughs> here. And it's, it's, it takes care of itself. I agree with you there. I feel like those types of gains are going to end up over time leveling out. And I feel like especially once if, you know, institutions start to pour in, which is probably going to skyrocket a lot of stuff, especially just the market cap in general. Like you said, uh, when we get over that trillion dollar mark, Things are going to get really interesting. I just can't wait to see, you know, how is the media going to respond to that? What's Wall Street going to say? What's CNBC going to say? What, you know, you know, what, what's going to happen? You know, what is the stance that people are going to take on that? You know, what does that mean? And actually, another thing that I hear people talk about a lot, like, you know, oh, is crypto going to create or replace fiat? You know, is it going to replace paper money? You know, are they going to be able to coexist in the future? You know, what is that going to be like? What's your opinion on that? Do you feel like there's a, a space for paper fiat and crypto to coexist? Or do you feel like paper fiat will eventually just be phased out? I think paper fiat is on the way out, way out of you, whether you believe in crypto or not. Just because, I mean, when you look at the credit card companies and the debit card companies and what they're doing, then PayPal, there is very much, it's, it, there is a war on cash going on right now. Yeah. And crypto is not even involved. So I, yeah. I think it will be used. Less and less, and especially when you think about it. People talk about crypto being used for crime, but if, if I'm a drug dealer, the best thing I want payment in is cash because it's yep. completely untraceable. You have no idea if you've got notes in your pocket. You, the chances are that someone has used them at some point to buy drugs, sell drugs, and use drugs. Yep. And there's, you've no way of knowing, you've no way of tracing it, and it's so much better than having it on the blockchain where you can actually look at it yep. and try and at least try and track who it was. So I think papers on the way out anyway but in terms of crypto and fiat coexisting i think what we will see is i think in more developed countries like the us and the uk where we have a good banking system we have a relatively stable government even if these banking systems have enormous cock-ups like the ones we saw in 2008 overall yeah. people still trust the banks i think as long as you've got that there's not going to be this complete switch to crypto where the government's just completely phased out. I think right. what we'll see, we'll see it's almost a worse scenario, really, because you'll see these government created cryptocurrencies where they actually have total control and more control than they did before. Yep. They don't need a bank to issue them, so they can just manipulate however they want. They can charge negative interest rates. They can do all these things that really haven't actually been possible with normal money. But on the flip side, if you don't like that, you can just hold your money in crypto. So I think 
crypto will certainly grow and gain a much larger market share of money, for want of a better term, than it's got now. But yeah. in developed countries, I don't see the governments being phased out, and I do see the two just coexisting. But I think that does depend very much on the country, because if you look at more countries with less stable governments and banking systems that are just an absolute shambles, like when you look at Argentina at the moment, you look at Zimbabwe, Venezuela... When you look at these countries, if you live in one of these countries where you've got this hyperinflation, you've got the government not letting you buy dollars, it's doing all this to try and keep you locked in a system where you're just losing your life savings. Right. At that point, it's a lot more likely that as a country, people will just switch to crypto on their own and slowly make that shift. Yep. Because if I live in Venezuela or Argentina, even if I don't necessarily believe in Bitcoin that much, if it's offered to me as an alternative to the peso or the Petrov or whatever it is they've got in Venezuela, yep. I'm probably going to use it just because at the end of the year, my life savings aren't all of a sudden just worth a loaf of bread. They're still worth <laughs> I mean, even with Bitcoin <laughs> volatility, if you only lose half in the, in this market, if yep. you lose half in Argentina or Venezuela, you're actually up yeah. because that's a massive win compared to what you would have lost right. if you had the government-backed currency. And I think in countries like that, once there is that shift from people where they're just like, hang on, we're not going to let you do this to us. Yep. There's no way for the government, short of blocking the internet completely, there's no way for them to get that power back. So I think yep. it will be interesting because I think in developed countries, we will have the two coexisting. But then in less developed countries, I think we will have countries that just switch on their own and they are completely using cryptocurrency. I agree. Yeah. And I can't wait for something like that to really happen. And uh, I can't wait for something like that to happen and be successful. That's going to be awesome to really be a guideline for other countries to follow and to do the same thing, whether, you know, they're using it for governmental practices or using it for real estate. I mean, any anything infrastructure like for a country and for them to take crypto and embed that into that, I feel like that would be a huge win, a huge plus for cryptocurrency. And then that would also create a really good dialogue for people to talk about and seeing like, OK, we can really kind of start to take this a little bit more serious and we can really see how we can take this and completely transform whole industries and make them a lot more simple just by implementing the whole idea of cryptocurrency. I mean, even just taking something as simple as real estate, when you think about real estate, the amount of time it takes for you in the U.S. to buy a house is almost ridiculous. You know, you have to go through title companies, which take a, a long period of time and things like that. You know, you can see where blockchain can come in and cryptocurrencies can come in and really help alleviate that type of, you know, quote unquote issue. You know, it, it can really help speeding things up and it could just make things a lot more easy to track and there, there'll be a lot more solid. You, you're not going to be able to just completely go in and, you know, change the title on a house if it's sitting on the blockchain. You know, that's this is not going to happen. So, you know, I feel like when those things like that start happening, that's when, you know, you'll see me walking around all the time with a grin on my face. And when I'm inside of anything dealing with cryptocurrency. So I definitely look forward to those days and those times for sure. I think that's one of the reasons why the government, when people talk about regulation versus non-regulation, I mean, everyone knows regulation is coming and people talk. I mean, there are some people that talk about, will they just ban cryptos? And there's no way... When you look at the crypto and blockchain and what it does, it, it just ticks so many government boxes. Yep. So it makes it easier for them to collect tax. It makes it easier for them to track stuff. And although that's not really what we want and not what it was designed for, it does a lot of things that the government is trying to do now, but less efficiently. Yep. And I think that just means when people think, oh, will this be a real thing? It, it, there's, I don't see another scenario. I, I, I just think it... it it is real. It's it's going to be accepted by government. It's just because there's too much. I mean, even when you look at the benefits of taxing it, I mean, why wouldn't the government want a slice? Because these things are going to continue happening. Exactly. But the government's going to want their share. They're going to want things on the blockchain because then it makes it easier for them to get a fee or whatever. And it, it, there's just so many way, reasons why the government is going to be pro this stuff in the long term. I definitely. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting, man. I can't wait. Fractional reserve lending coming to, to a cryptocurrency near you. <laughs> Eventually, it'll probably happen, man. This is a great conversation. I highly appreciate you coming on the show, man. Had a great time. Great, great dialogue. I feel like people enjoy this when they hear it. You know, people will definitely have something to pull away from this. You know what? One last question I want to ask you. I like to ask this to everybody who comes on the show. What mark do you want to leave? on blockchain and cryptocurrency? What what do you want to do? What what do you want to be your staple? I think what I want and what I want for other people as well is, is just to be involved. 
I think I, I know it's a very low aspiration, but but when I was younger, I mean, I was born in 1995, so I completely I was too young to be involved in the internet boom and all everything that came with that and all the excitement. When I first got into investing, I was I was almost annoyed that I'd missed this because it was it was just like nothing's going to happen like this again. Because even mm-hmm. if you look at the internet and what happened with that, there's so much change so quickly. It, nothing had ever happened like it before. And it was just, it must have been so exciting to be a part of that. Yep. And that was an opportunity I just thought I'd missed. And then I did miss it. But yeah. then this has come around and there's there's just so many different things that can be changed by it. And I think it, it's so exciting to just be a part of it. And especially right now, now because we are very much early adopters. People aren't, aren't really talking about it. People don't really understand it. it. It's not as mainstream as it's going to be in the future. Yep. And I think I would just like to encourage people to just get involved and just find a way to involve yourself, even if it's just taking that plunge and investing in it and actually genuinely leaving it and not just taking it once you've doubled your money, just being a part of this from now until wherever this thing goes, because I think it's something you'll look back on and you'll be so pleased you did it because it is an amazing thing to be a part of. Yeah, I agree 100%. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it from Sam Bar himself. Learn about crypto and blockchain as fast as possible. You know, definitely don't miss the wave. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, it went then. Yeah, that's weird. It went. Hello? Yep, can you still hear me? Wait, if I just, I'll just switch to, that might be a bit. Hello? Hello, hello. Hello. That was weird. <laughs> that was so weird. It just like completely. That was a super odd. That was really weird. <laughs> like my whole computer screen just went black, and I could still hear you, but then I couldn't see anything. You know, I want to say when I changed it to audio only because I hope that may, might make a difference, but it didn't. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that was that was super weird. Okay, no, I think I think we're good. Yeah, and everything's still recording and everything. That was I. Well, anyway, we'll edit that part out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks a lot, man. Um, I really appreciate you coming on the show again. Had a great time talking to you. Great time chatting. The dialogue was awesome. I'm hoping that you, you know, you'll you'll be happy to come back on the show in the future. You know, see see where things are a couple months from now and uh, have some more conversations. Uh, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed being on the show. Awesome, awesome. No problem at all, man. Well. That's it for today's show, everybody. We appreciate you tuning in, and uh, we hope everybody has a great day. Hey, Morty. Huh? Oh. No, not today. Get the fuck out, Rick. Wow. What crawled into your space cruiser and died? All they wanted was some help finding Morty. We'd like to thank everyone for your support here at the Bullpen Podcast all season long and look forward to having you at the next episode. We'd also like to give a special thanks to the team behind the scenes that make this show possible. Today's show notes can be found on our website at thebullpenpodcast.io forward slash post show stats. Also, don't forget to like and retweet us at one bullpen podcast. That's the number one bullpen podcast. And to watch Lyndon do some exciting and probably some weird things too, tune into the Snapchat at the Crypto Bully. That's at the Crypto Bully. It's been a pleasure, and see you at the next show. Good night, everyone.